Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, Sean with Mythos and Logos here, joined by Christian, uh, New Orleanian tour guide, local creature feature, uh, connoisseur of all things spooky in the Crescent City. We are going to go over some little bit of history today, looking into religious syncretism, voodoo, practices for respect of the dead, as Christian spends a lot of his time in cemeteries, but with very good reason, as we'll learn. All that being said, said, let's go ahead and dive into our Halloween special as we explore some of the dark side of one of the most uniquely American cities. Christian, I appreciate you coming on. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. My wife and I recently came back from a trip to New Orleans, back here in Texas now, and we needed something to do one evening. She was a little too tired to hit Bourbon Street, so looked up, oh, here's a cemetery ghost tour. Christian, your storytelling on it, the way you tied in history to, well, the the mythic and spooky history, urban legends into verified history into modern struggles that are still going on that you weaved all of those threads together so masterfully and i just knew we had to have you on Jeez. especially i know you go back over 250 years you had mentioned in the city and yeah. would just love to learn a little more of your experience maybe what drew you to the kind of work that you do i feel like it's not uh what most folks think about on career day at school but uh yeah would love to learn a little bit more about you your history with the city and then we can go in i wanted to start with a shout out this is our halloween episode so as usual this month's proceeds will be donated to charity as october is domestic violence awareness month we will be donating to rain r-a-i-n-n -N, fantastic organization christian suggested also a quick announcement for housekeeping. We recently passed 10,000 subscribers, so we will be hosting a question and answer session, most likely after the next uh, scripted feature video. Ask your questions down in the comments and in email. It's in the contact information on YouTube if that's where you're watching or listening. That said, though, Christian, I'll let you take it from here. Tell us a bit more about uh, what drew you to this. Uh, well, first off, I want to start off saying, uh, yeah, uh, my family bloodline has been here for nearly three centuries. You said that I've been here. I want to clarify, I have not been here for over 250 years. I get the vampire stuff enough out here in New Orleans as it is. I've always been really fascinated with just the stories that happen here in New Orleans. It's a very unique culture and city here. And I was born here. I lived abroad for almost a decade, like out, out of the country. Uh, when I was like nine to 18, I lived in Guatemala. And the entire time I missed New Orleans, like I just remembered it being when I was I was a kid, the Mardi Gras, the architecture, just the general, you know, je ne sais quoi of the city. And I was like, I got to go back. I got to go back. When I was 12 years old, Hurricane Katrina happened and I watched it on TV like most people did. And I was like, oh, I guess I can't go back. Eventually, I uh, when I was 18, I got the chance to fly back internationally by myself, no strings attached. I hopped on a plane, came back to New Orleans with nothing but a bag of clothes, a guitar and a dream in my heart. I wanted to come back here and be part of the local music scene. Then I got back here and found out everybody's in the local music scene in New Orleans pretty much. But I kind of, I kind of carved out a little niche for myself. I'll, I'll admit originally I wasn't the biggest like history buff back in the day when I was a kid. Like history seemed interesting. I was more into like mythology and religion and stuff like like sort of like that kind of stuff mm. but really into egyptian mythology ancient history stuff like that i didn't care too much about like the nitty-gritty like wasn't a huge fan of like american history and stuff like that to be honest or european history until i started learning about new orleans history and then that kind of started the snowball effect of where i wanted to know more and more and more and more and now I'm a professional historical tour guide and spooky tour guide. You know, you can take ghost stories with a grain of salt, but I try my best to root things as much into reality as possible, which with New Orleans can be difficult sometimes. You know, the lines get blurred between historical fact and aggrandized mythology of the city. But I try to stay close as possible to historical fact because I'll just put it this way, you know, the truth is often spookier than fiction here in New Orleans. Definitely a few different larger than life figures. I'd love to go in and get a bit of the clarification of how much we know in terms of what's documented and then how much is the legend and how much overlap there might be. So a little bit of bio. I was a history teacher for some time. Public school system left a lot to be desired in terms of career support. Mm -hmm. uh, but Afterwards, I mean, this podcast is an outlet for that now where I can get a little more into 
the aspects of history that don't necessarily make it on a school curriculum too. We think a lot of America, the United States, I should say specifically, as this melting pot is something that's often said of cultures. But I think especially with New Orleans, it can be very much a mixed stew, a gumbo, if you will, yeah. uh, in that there's so much that goes in, yet in a mixed stew, right? Each part of it retains its flavor, but gives some of its flavor to everything else as well. New Orleans is, other than maybe, well, Texas famously has six flags that fly above it. In South Texas, there is a seventh. Laredo, Texas was an independent country under the Republic of the Rio Grande. But I think in terms of the amounts of people who've come through one place from different parts of the world. I think you're hard pressed to find any place other than maybe New York City yeah. that has it at the level with New Orleans. Local native cultures. Uh, we were able on our drive through Acadiana to stop by the Chitimacha Nation Museum, which was mm. so fascinating and well worth a visit if you're in the area. Then when we blend that in with French with Spanish, with the specific sort of Cajun French, Anglo-Americans, and then also being one of the largest ports of the South, having the West African influences that resulted from the global slave trade, having had from the Haitian Revolution, how many people had gone from that island to New Orleans as well, coming together in one place. Oh, and. Absolutely. That's where I'd like to hear your thoughts a bit on the the syncretism, because it's not only cultural traditions, but a lot of religious traditions that came together and ones that usually wouldn't seem to mesh quite well, seem to have formed their own unique expression that you don't really see anyplace else. Yeah, I would say like you make a good point that like maybe New York City might have a bit more diversity uh, culturally, but I even still would wonder because like I always put it this way, like where else are you going to find a neighborhood that would have, you know, a Catholic cathedral, you know, a Protestant church, a Jewish synagogue or temple, uh, a Hare Krishna temple, a Scientology center, and a voodoo temple, like all in the same kind of little area. You know, like we do have a, a, a wide variety of, of religions and faiths and cultures out here. We have a strong, used to have a much stronger Native American presence out here. We have a strong uh, uh, African culture out here, Asian culture. Hispanic culture is very big here. And of course, you know, um, Americans and, you know, European descent out here all just kind of blended together. Kind of like one of the, New Orleans has like a thousand different nicknames, you know, uh, the Big Easy, the City of the Dead, the Necropolis. But, you know, one of the big ones is like the accidental city, like a city that just, just kind of fell together by accident. All these different elements just kind of ended up here for one reason or another which it has the benefit of being at the very mouth of the Mississippi River, which is like the, the, a massive river that runs through like more than a third of the United States of America. So a lot of people were interested in coming to this port for a lot of different reasons to navigate this, the new world. And it all just kind of fell together. And it wasn't exactly a very smooth and easy blending together. Like a lot of it involved a lot of conflict and a lot of pain and a lot of struggle and fight. But over time, it all kind of blended together in the end where I won't say there aren't still problems to this day, of course, but things seem to have gotten to a point where it's just like, hey, we're in New Orleans. We all generally accept each other. We, mm -hmm. There's enough like problems in the world already for us to be like hashing out things that like we've all kind of blended past at this point. I, I do remember one thing that was striking on your tour. You had mentioned that so many people from around the South who, for whatever reason, aren't able to be welcomed, whether it's by their immediate family, which is especially tragic, or their communities in yeah. general. New Orleans kind of is serves as a magnet for that. And yeah. it's interesting that now there is that culture of acceptance that, of course, everything is still a work in progress, but that it is something that's present now a lot more than in a lot of other places, but also in than in a lot of other times. For a lot of New Orleans history, you wouldn't have found as many different expressions of religion as you do today under uh, the Catholic monarchies that had been in charge. I wonder how much of the unique expressions that we see today have to do with the ways that a lot of folks seem to have taken almost covert operations <laughs> to, uh, to maintain their traditions. Mm -hmm. My understanding and Africa, West Africa especially, is a very, very much a blind spot in my knowledge that I need to educate myself a lot more on in terms of history. But mm -hmm. my understanding is that a lot of what we would refer to as voodoo 
spirits. I'm not sure if that would even be the right word. Uh, often word. come from the expressions of traditional West African religions in a lot of that case, right? Yes. I would say, to clarify, I don't want to tout myself as some masterful expert on the voodoo faith, but I will say I do know a good bit about it. I talk about it professionally to a degree. Um, so I would I would say, yeah, you, you could refer to things as spirits. Uh, there is actually a lot of a lot of similarity between I always say between the structure of like Catholicism and, and voodoo. There is a lot of overlap. Uh, so that's kind of why there was a synchronicity between these two different uh, religions from very different cultures in very different parts of the world. But there is enough overlap that like the voodoo faith kind of can be channeled through like what you know people consider like Catholic practices and so forth. A lot of folks consider voodoo an offshoot of Catholicism. A lot of voodoo practitioners are Catholic. Spirituality and reaching out to spirits is a big part of the voodoo faith. I remember you had mentioned on the tour a little bit of the cosmology. It was surprising to me that the the voodoo faith is, I did not expect it to be monotheistic. Yeah, it's, it's a similar structure. So like how the Catholic faith works, where at the very top, there is one supreme creator. The Catholics have, you know, God, the Trinity, all that. Whereas uh, in in voodoo, they actually have a word, bon Dieu, or bon Dieu, oh. which is basically French for good God. There's other, you know, names, but basically bon Dieu is like a coverall. There's also like underneath that. So you know how in, in Catholicism, they have the saints, whereas in, in voodoo, they have loa. Loa are uh, spirits that are like sort of in charge of certain aspects of human life. It's said that there may be over a thousand different loa. Uh, a few hundred have actual names that have been recorded. For me, the ones that uh, stood out the most are like Urzuli, for example. Urzuli is the Loa for love. And there's like different forms of Urzuli for different forms of love. Uh, and the one that everybody knows the most about is Baron Samadhi. Uh, Baron Samadhi uh, wears the top hat, has a skull face, known to love cigars, rum, raunchy humor. I always say he's my kind of guy. <laughs> but yeah, that's the guy to the other side, basically. If you need to deal with the afterlife, that's the Loa you would uh, do a ritual for, you'd reach out to. And so there's a lot of similarity. When voodoo was illegal in New Orleans, because up until the Americans took over in 1803, New Orleans was under French rule, then Spanish rule, then French rule again for, for a brief moment. But up until then, it was all by law Catholic. You had to be Catholic. Severe consequence if you're caught practicing anything but Catholicism. Voodoo practitioners would use Catholic iconography to kind of like blur the line, like kind of uh, acclimate. Particularly the voodoo queen Marie Laveau uh, would often use uh, Catholic imagery and Catholic idols uh, to sort of ease her clientele into being more comfortable with her voodoo practices. For Baron Samadhi, uh, a good parallel uh, saint would be uh, St. Peter, who guards the pearly gates of heaven. Right, your intercessor, that's the... Uh the psychopomp bringing you to the other side. Yeah, you're the middleman between here and there. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of different little similarities. Like, you know, like I happen to have some like um, voodoo skull ro rosary beads. Cause like I'm a recovering Catholic. I was born to a Catholic parent and raised Catholic. And over time, my view of religion has uh, become very grown out, spread around. It's a mix of a lot of different things, mm. um, you know, I wouldn't say I, I would subscribe to a single particular one, but I was raised with Catholic traditions and I wouldn't say I'm a practicing Catholic, but I would say that I've learned a lot of different faiths all over the world. Like I'm wearing an Ankh and like the, the voodoo rosary does come in handy. I do have like ritual in my life and it's largely because of, of growing up in New Orleans and seeing like a variety. And when I was a kid, I got really into Egyptian mythology, Greek mythology, I read the Bible, you know, front to back and learn about Satanism and all these different channels that people like understand spirituality and God through. And so voodoo in particular really seems like a very beautiful religion and a very powerful one to me. So that's why I'm so fascinated by it. I appreciate the personal sort of aspect you're giving too. It, it, it seems to me you're having this personal journey that had been a lot of branching out, yet what you're raised in is going to shape your worldview as you go. And yeah. I think it kind of ties to historically when the structures of societies weren't in the liberal, and by that I don't mean necessarily Democrat, but in the freedom way of liberal society that we have, where you can 
choose your religion and you can yeah. say what you want. But when societies were very much structured around that hierarchy of the Catholic Church, it seemed like people had to find ways to express that were either within but at the bounds of. And I do think that historically Catholicism more than a lot of other branches of Christianity has done very good at integrating things mm -hmm. uh, and those practices. We did a video a while back on Bridget, who's a figure that was historically one of the Tuatadon and the old gods of Ireland, who after the conversion of Ireland has been viewed as a Catholic saint. It's fascinating how that is maybe similar to the ways that people would have to express or fit their belief systems that they had taken from other parts of the world, the things that shaped them, regardless of where your future is, how your past shapes you, mm. into a society that was very much founded around the Catholic Church. And you mentioned Marie Laveau, and she was called the voodoo queen, credited with popularizing a lot of the traditions. But my understanding is she considered herself to be a Catholic. Is that right? Absolutely. She was born, uh, well, our, our you know, it's one of those things where it's like records can be a little wonky. It's generally uh, established that she was born on 1801 on September 10th. Some say she may have been born in the 1780s, but it's generally consensus is she was born September 10th, 1801. She was born Catholic, baptized Catholic, and practiced Catholicism, was devout her entire life. Uh, she would attend Mass at every every week at, you know, St. Louis Cathedral. She, when she was married, and uh, I believe... 1819, she was married to a fellow named Jacques Perry. And she, uh, when she got married to him, she was actually married by Père Antoine, the Catholic priest of St. Louis Cathedral. And that's the main cathedral in Jackson Square, right? Yes, right at Jackson Square in the center of the original city. Then I understand that a lot of what had brought her to fame was she became someone who people could go to. I understand she was a free woman of color, Creole, pardon my ignorance, that's essentially a mixed kind of identity, is that right? Creole, an old basically French word that means like raised in or raised by. Now, some folks define Creole as specifically from Caribbean, like Afro- centric heritage. But in New Orleans is generally the consensus is if you were born in this culture that is a mix of French, Spanish and, and African uh, culture, you are Creole. So if, you're, if okay. you grew up in New Orleans, if you're from New Orleans, that's Creole. She was a Creole woman. On her mother's side, she was African and Native American, I believe. And mm -hmm. so she did have like Native American roots. Okay. Um, as well. On her father's side, is, is there's a bit of a debate on whether father was either a white or, you know, mostly white uh, guy named Charles Laveau, who was a politician, or a Haitian immigrant named, another man named Charles Laveau may have been her father. There is a little bit of, like, discrepancy on that just because of, like, very old records from, like, the, you know, late 17, early 1800s, names being spelled weirdly and stuff like that. That's why there's a little bit of uh, confusion there. But in either case, we know that she was a product of this culturally mixed society and that she had done a lot of herbal healing and yes. prison ministries and things like that. Yeah, I will say that Marie Laveau really did serve as a sort of her personality, her who she was serve as a good bridge between different cultures that were very much divided. Like when I say divided, I mean like very much hardcore segregated. So Marie Laveau would be considered Octoroon, which I will use that word in a historical context because it is very much can be used as a derogatory racial term. But octoroon basically means one eighth non-white. Uh, quadroon means one quarter non-white. And these were an actual class of people um, here in New Orleans. It was basically the sort of middle ground class of like mixed race people um, where they were basically treated in higher regard than purely black people. But uh, they were also not given the same rights as purely white people. The whole one drop rule thing. Marie Laveau was a little bit higher social status because she was of a lot, a lot of uh, white descendants, but also still a Creole black woman. So you could see how she was almost like a marginal figure able to yeah. be, to return to the well, metaphor, almost like the broth uniting the different parts in a way. Um, so like one great example is she actually 
was not only dealing with the enslaved people and like dealing with the voodoo practice and all that, but she was also, I mean, she was famously a hairdresser and her clientele were often tend to be the wealthy white women of New Orleans, the highest class of society. She developed a, a powerful reputation of being an incredible hairdresser. So her clientele would be these wealthy white women, the, the wives of, of powerful plantation owners. And these white women would go to Marie Laveau to get their hair done. Or they would have Marie Laveau come to their home and get their hair done. And sometimes they would get, you know, get together and Marie Laveau would be working with them. And Laveau would get to overhear a lot of very juicy gossip about a lot of very powerful people. And that worked in her benefit. She was known as a bit of an information broker. Information is a powerful tool. So she was able to learn a lot about a lot of people in positions of power. And that benefited her in many ways. And it benefited the people that uh, she cared about in many ways, particularly also the enslaved people that were working for those wealthy white folks. The enslaved people would want to curry favor with Marie Laveau, or perhaps Marie Laveau would help them cure them of some kind of disease or help them in some other way. And they would pay her back with letting her know something. And Marie Laveau was very powerful with root work, uh, with uh, herbal remedies and, and cures and ritual cures. She was a bit of a medicine woman, you know. Some say that she would go to the poor people, go to the poor neighborhoods and heal all the poor people free of charge with whatever cure she had for them. Then she'd go to the rich people and sell the same thing to them from her arm, arm and leg, you know. <laughs> we, and we love her for it. So I guess that raises the question then, which is at the core of what I'm wondering and why I wanted to go to you for this, which is what do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions in terms of New Orleans, in terms of voodoo, yeah. examples of people who get it wrong, examples of people who get it right? What do you think folks from outside of the culture could stand to learn? First thing I'll say is everything you've learned about voodoo from TV and movies is largely just made up stuff that was created to scare white people. And I mean that very seriously. Like, the very first ever uh, voodoo mention in like movies or, or entertainment media was a movie called White Zombie starring Bella Lugosi. That whole movie was just them being like, all right, we've done Dracula, we've done the Wolfman, we've done Frankenstein, we've done the Invisible Man, we're running out of monsters, we're starting to do Dracula 3, Frankenstein 4, Son of Frankenstein, all this kind of stuff. What haven't we messed with yet? And then voodoo came into somebody's head and so the whole thing is like voodoo is evil it will possess you and take you over and make you do evil things this is like which is also i believe the first time uh, a voodoo doll was depicted in an american film i always say the voodoo doll is a perfect example of like the misconceptions voodoo dolls do exist to this day they're being used but whatever you've seen from hollywood about voodoo dolls is completely made up uh, there's no voodoo spell that we're toning you into a chucky doll trust me i've tried i got a chucky doll over here <laughs> I love the Chucky movies and I always get a laugh when he goes, Awe, do it, Dambala. It's like, that's silly. But voodoo dolls do exist originally. The voodoo doll was actually used as a sort of medical record file. Way back in the day, you go to a voodoo practitioner after you tried the American doctor. Like, I always put it this way. Say you got like some kind of ailment, like you got, uh, let's say you got a headache, a really bad headache. You can't get rid of the migraines or whatever. And you go to an American doctor, the American doctor's like, oh, you got brain pain? Don't worry, we'll cut your head right off. You won't feel a thing afterwards. Because <laughs> uh, that was basically, you had an injury, like a lot of the times they would jump straight to amputation or something. Whereas voodoo practitioners would use herbal remedies, which were often frowned upon as witchcraft. There's a term in the Bible for it, pharmakia. And that's the root of pharmaceutical. Yeah, exactly. So they believed using herbal remedies and medicinal plants and stuff like that was witchcraft. Famous example, uh, Andrew Jackson, seventh president of the United States, at one time considered the craziest president in American history. He was known to love getting into duels all the time. Some say he was in dozens, some say he was in over a hundred duels, constantly trying to prove something to somebody. He famously got shot in the arm in one of these duels and he went to the American doctor and the American doctor was like, oh, you got a bullet in your arm? Don't worry, boss. We'll cut your arm right off and stitch you right up and uh, hopefully you'll live another week or two. So then Andrew Jackson went to a Native American healer and the Native American healer used herbal remedies to clean the wound, to uh, get the bullet out. And Andrew Jackson famously got to keep his arm and genocide the Native Americans afterwards as payback, I guess. That was a common thing. Like you go to an American doctor, their healing wouldn't be that up to snuff. So then you go to the voodoo witch doctor and they would tend to have medical remedies that would actually work a lot better. So you go to the voodoo practitioner and you say, hey, I got a terrible stomachache. I don't know how to get rid of it. It's been going on for a while. So what they would do, they take a little doll 
you know, basic like little sort of stick figure shape stuff with Spanish moss. Maybe it's just a stick, but it's basically a humanoid shape. And they would take an article of your clothing or something that belonged to you, let's say like an earring or just a piece of cloth that belongs to you. They attach it to the doll, and now that doll is registered as your medical record file. That belongs to you. It's marked. So then they identify what part of the body they're working on. Let's say your stomach. So they take, originally, uh, they would take a thorn. They later moved on to pins or nails, and it would be painted with a certain color to register to mark what type of healing, what kind of potion, what kind of ritual that they were going to give you for your healing. So then they insert it into the part of the doll that corresponds to what part of the body they're working on. And then they give you the ritual or the potion or whatever healing you're supposed to do. They send you on your merry way. And they put that little uh, voodoo doll up on a shelf or somewhere safe. Then you go out and you try the healing. If it works, you come back and you say, your voodoo magic worked on me. Thank you so much. They uh, take the pin out of the doll. They give you back your article. And you're on your way. If the, if the healing didn't work, they pull the pin out, put a different pin in, try again with something new. Mm-hmm. And that's where the original voodoo doll came from, uh, was that medical record file. Nowadays, voodoo dolls are used very much in the same way as a grigri in a lot of ways. Voodoo dolls are nowadays sold in shops out here with a specific intention, like certain charm to it. You know, maybe this voodoo doll is to bring love into your life, or this voodoo doll is to bring career help, or something that's like protection, purification, safety, things like that. But, you know, that's how the voodoo doll originally started out. That is fascinating. Gosh, if I thought of a voodoo doll before you think of, oh, I'm going to poke a pin in you, so it'll hurt you there. And when it it, it seems like what you're saying, historically, it's the opposite. You hurt here? Okay, well, let's mark like, okay, you have a headache? Well, let's put a pin in your head of your doll that says Tylenol, so we know we gave you a Tylenol and see if it works. Um, Exactly. So one thing that really struck me too, when we had gone on the cemetery tour you had led, was the way that a lot of folks had disrespected graves in New Orleans. When yes. we were on the tour, you had mentioned how Marilyn Manson had tried to, my understanding is even bringing to Marie Laveau that the punk band, the Misfits had tried to rob from her grave. And it's like, there's so much, it seems like there's this disconnect between where the the spooky Hollywood version of folks using things for their yeah. their shock value or yeah or to be outside. edgy yes yeah. is just ends up disrespecting the culture they're allegedly trying to pay homage to. So for the Marilyn Manson story to shed some light on that, it's actually so I got a copy of his autobiography, Long Hard Ride Out of Hell. And he mentions that incident in the book because a lot of this book is about how uh, he started out his career, how he got into music, how he started off starting the band in Florida, then came to New Orleans and worked with Trent Reznor and created Antichrist Superstar, which is what really launched Marilyn Manson as a superstar celebrity. We do have a cemetery here called Holt Cemetery. Locally, it's been nicknamed the Poor Man's Graveyard because this is the last cemetery in the city that still allows people to bury their dead directly in the ground if they can't afford a more proper burial. Literally... And I'm not making this up. You pay the cemetery keepers 50 bucks. They hand you a shovel and you go out there and you bury your loved one's dead body. Uh, The place has been refilled three times over. You go out there and you see tombstones that are made out of styrofoam, people's names and dates written down with magic marker. One grave is marked by a child's blues clues tricycle. This is where people get buried who have no money. They don't get to afford a... $300,000 $300,000 crypt covered in angelic statues, you know. These are the these are the real people of New Orleans that this is the best they can do and there seems to be an intense beauty in the way that with no money this is how they they protect, they treat, they they celebrate their dead. They try to make a mark in some way or other. And when you go out there and you bury your dead, you're probably digging up at least one, two or three other people's bones in the process. It's considered by many locals a very special sacred spot because this is, it's a very sad place it's a lot of tragedy a lot of pain it's considered one of the most haunted cemeteries in the city and we don't like when people disrespect it it actually gets locked up at 2 45 p.m every day except sundays it's not even open they lock it up with a big gate they, they actually had to build up a big wall around it to keep folks from being disrespectful and doing mess up things people would steal bones and famously, Marilyn Manson, uh, the band, while they were recording Antichrist Superstar back in the early 90s at Trent Reznor's studio on Magazine Street, they broke in a whole cemetery one night and stole a bunch of the human bones, took them back to the recording studio, ground them up, and smoked them in meth pipes and snorted a bunch of the powdered up bones, which he said in his autobiography was one of the worst trips of his life. But at least now we know why he's like that, I guess. 
And there was another incident in 2015 that's now known as the New Orleans Grave Robbing Tumblr, which this young teenage non-binary white person from Florida was living here in New Orleans, you know, messing around with Wicca, voodoo, Satanism, getting into the occult practices. And they were walking by a whole cemetery every day on their way to, to and from work. After heavy rainfall, after flooding, human bones tend to come up to the surface more in some of these cemeteries. They noticed human bones and they're like, oh, the, the cemetery is offering me human bones to use in rituals. So they started messing around with them in rituals, eventually getting a brilliant idea to start selling the human bones on Tumblr to their witchy friends. And that's caused a massive outcry of anger and pain from people who are like, what are you doing? This is incredibly disrespectful. So after that incident, fortunately, the silver lining of this is because of this person causing this disrespect and this pain, they built this massive wall around the cemetery so people can no longer access it unless they're like going through the proper gate, usually with a tour guide, such mm -hmm. as myself. And is that where you had mentioned that it was only after that, that it actually became a crime because it wasn't even on the books earlier? Yes, uh, at that point, she was charged with the hefty charge of petty theft because they didn't have any laws on the books about stealing bones in the graves of New Orleans or selling human remains in the state of Louisiana. Apparently, it is a federal crime. It was a federal crime at the time, but there was no state laws against desecrating a grave at that point, from what I understand. What I have to wonder is why, and maybe it's a question with no answer when we think of the individual people, right? Mm -hmm. But why someone might, well, I mean, you can explore what you want to explore because it's your own life, but then being able to do it in a respectful way where you're consulting people and learning history of traditions versus being the edgy, oh, I saw this in a scary movie. Let me try and do that. Yeah. If you're a tourist coming into town, how can you be mindful to be respectful of the historical and living cultures that you're visiting? I think I'll start off first thing by saying when you come and visit New Orleans, make sure you come to visit as much of New Orleans as you can. I think a big pet peeve of mine is I think like probably half the people that come to visit New Orleans head straight to Bourbon Street and they get completely trashed on the, the hand grenades and the fish bowls and the hurricanes and by the end of it, they don't even remember they were in New Orleans to begin with. And that's a common thing. But there's so much beautiful culture here, art, food, so many different neighborhoods. It's not just the French Quarter. A big misconception is New Orleans is just the French Quarter. I've overheard so many tourists just being on like a, the complete opposite side of town, like on the phone, being like, I'm out here on Bourbon Street. We're out here partying. And it's just like, no, New Orleans is a big, it's a relatively small town, but it's a big place when it comes to many different cultures and parts of town different things to see. You got the, the Marigny Bywater, you got Uptown, you got the Garden District. Oh, I love the Garden District. It's, it's so many beautiful places to check out, but that's one of my biggest pet peeves. People come to this city and will get completely trashed, go to the strip clubs, party, and then barely even remember being here, which, you know, if that's what you want, good for you. But I recommend checking a little bit more into the culture as well. Taking tours, I'm not just saying that because I'm a tour guide, but like taking tours is a great way to learn the city's history. Going to the museum, learn about the voodoo at the voodoo museum, learn about stuff at the jazz museum. We have this new museum called Storyville Museum, which is about how um, uh, the first red light district in American history was here in New Orleans because originally the entire city was a red light district. Sex work was oh. everywhere. And so they contained it to a single neighborhood. That single neighborhood, the idea was a guy named Sidney Story was an alderman of the city. He was like, well, we can't get rid of all the... You know, the drinking, the gambling, the sex work, and that dirty, filthy, unholy jazz music. The worst of all. I know. It was making, could you believe it? Like, white people listening to black music, black people working in white venues. I couldn't, it was, it was unholy. That's literally how they felt back in the day. So jazz was illegal. So they actually decided to condense all these things into one single neighborhood. And they decided to name it after the guy who came up with the idea, Sydney Story. They decided <laughs> to commemorate it by naming it Storyville. Storyville was the red light district. So it's a really cool little museum to learn about. There's so much history. There's so much to learn about from so many different things. And my point is like, check out the museums and take those tours, not just the spooky tours, but come take a spooky tour, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. And if you do take those tours, if you're doing a pub crawl in the French Quarter, enjoy the drinks. Try not to give your tour guide too hard of a time. If you're doing a historical tour, if you're walking through the French Quarter on a historical tour, you can bring a drink with you. Please don't get too trashed. Don't pop, pass that on the tour. We hate when that happens. But if you're going to the cemeteries tours, this is a big pet peeve of mine. Please be respectful. One of my stops is the Hurricane Katrina Memorial. Right. You were there. You know yeah. how seriously Pretty I take it. Touching. Yeah. Yeah. It's And you just walking in there, I feel like people should feel it's a powerful and sad place. 
there are, I don't want to speak ill of my colleagues, but there are tour guides that don't work with me who will bring in tour groups that are completely drunk. I see them holding the hand grenades from Bourbon Street. I see them double fisting Budweiser's and they're mm-hmm. laughing and partying. And it's like, these are the graves of the last 98 victims of Hurricane Katrina that we could not identify who they were. These are unmarked graves. And this memorial was specifically built to commemorate that they died in this tragedy and we have no idea who they are or who their families are. This is not a place to be getting blackout drunk and partying. Please do not do that. Imagine if somebody was on your mother's grave partying, like turning down for what, you know, all that. Don't, don't do that. Twice. Not once, wow. twice. Twice I have seen a young woman get blackout drunk, vomit on the Hurricane Katrina Memorial. Oh, Lord. Pass out. Do not be that tourist, please. I feel like that's common sense, but it's just like, put it this way, just pace yourself. If you're going to a cemetery, don't go with party vibes, please. <laughs> they start partying after. <laughs> after, yeah. Get the get the solemn, respectful part out of the way, then go have a party. That's why you have, take a cemetery tour, bring maybe a drink or two, not too crazy. Afterwards, ask your tour guide for recommendations on where to get completely trashed, and I'll, I'll hook you up. So we touched upon the gumbo of cultures that have made so many different types of expression of life and death and spirituality in New Orleans. Is there anything that you think specifically makes New Orleans so in touch with that city of the dead identity? Because I feel like even in places like Manhattan, where you have just as many different groups coming together, it's not death that tends to be one of the uniters. Yeah. Well, I will say people often wonder, why is it the most haunted city in America? Well, that story starts way before the city was here. Originally, this landmass was created by sludge being pushed down the Mississippi River for countless thousands of years, creating this swampland, and it wasn't unpopulated. We know for at least 30,000 years, there were many different tribes of Native Americans here. Uh, predominantly, the Choctaw Nation were in this area, but also like the Natchez tribe, Seminole. The Native Americans, they referred to this area as Bull Bancha. Bobancha translates loosely to the land of many tongues or many languages because so many different cultures, so many different tribes would move to this area. They'd meet up in this area to exchange goods with each other, but they would never settle here. And they warned the Europeans to not settle in this cursed, haunted swampland. That if the creatures wouldn't get you, the spirits would. The Europeans were like, yeah, what do you know about anything? You know, y'all are primitive, savage Native Americans. So they, the Europeans start genociding the Native Americans inside of New Orleans right here for military and, and commercial purposes to lock down the mouth of the river. And suddenly they quickly find out that they're getting killed out here. For a few decades, in the very first decades of New Orleans, the average lifespan, life expectancy in New Orleans was roughly one year on average. Like people would die within a few months, maybe a couple years, but the average was most of these folks are gonna die within a year or so of being here because of plague, because of natural disasters and weather. At one point, we accidentally burned down the whole damn city twice. In 1788, it took about five hours for an accidental fire to burn down like 80 five percent of the city in five hours 856 buildings out of roughly 1100 it was a good friday the reason that the fire was so bad was because one of our uh treasurers at the time lit some candles on his altar to celebrate good friday and the entire city is built out of incredibly flammable cypress wood because curtains caught on fire and it caused a massive spread of fire the emergency system was to run to st louis cathedral to ring the bells so everybody knows there's an emergency but you're not allowed to ring cathedral bells on good fridays they told the priest to go ring him and the priest was like no that we can't ring the bells on a good friday not until after Easter sunday that's disrespectful to god so the entire city burned down in five hours and killed roughly a thousand people in one night and then six years later the second great fire burned down the rest of the city we also every 15 to 20 years get hit with a catastrophic hurricane we'd like to think we're better at handling it in the modern era but katrina definitely proved that we could have done better A lot of things could have gone better about that. 1,100 people drowned in Katrina, and the entire disaster itself caused the deaths of roughly 10,000 people in New Orleans. That a lot of a lot of times you won't hear that number, but if you look into it, the disaster itself caused all this death in so many different ways. Right, the deaths of misery, as they're called, from folks who just couldn't get back to their normal life when their world had been torn apart around them. Absolutely, misery definitely will lead to death in a lot of cases. Desperation. Mm. People struggling to survive. Sometimes death comes from people trying to survive. Mental health issues and stuff like that. Also, yellow fever was a big killer in the city. Ironically, yellow fever started killing a lot in New Orleans the year after the Great Fire of 1788 because they figured, okay, what do we do to prevent another city fire? 
let's put massive troughs of water on all the, the city street corners. You know who loves massive troughs of water? Mosquitoes. So mosquitoes were breeding like crazy and causing people to have yellow fever. And yellow fever is one of the most horrifying ways I can imagine ever dying. Sometimes it would be hundreds, sometimes it would be thousands, but from 1789 to 1905, we had the yellow fever epidemics. So like death is a big part of it. And one of the most tragic things about yellow fever is that most of the people who died were children. Mm. I'd mentioned to you, cause you had mentioned, um, I believe Irish roots of some. Yes. Of some yes. My grandmother was born there. Yeah. So, uh, the well, Irish. Good, good job, by the yeah. way. <laughs> yeah. Tie it all together. So the Irish would actually die at a much more alarming rate from yellow fever because when they were immigrating here to come here, they'd have to come for the summer because traveling the waters during the winter time would be certain death. So their best chance would be to come here during the summer. And when they get here, they're starved, they're emaciated. They've been on a boat for God knows how long they're in bad health and they're coming right into a city that's being ravaged by yellow fever. So normally say in a household of three people, you'd have an odds of one out of three dying. With the Irish, it was two out of three dying. If you go to the St. Patrick's cemeteries here in New Orleans, and most of the, the New Orleans cemeteries, especially the Catholic ones, they're very regimented, very oriented. They're called cities of the dead because they literally look like cities. They even have street names. You wonder where your family's crypt is. You go down this street and that street. They have names for all the little pathways. In the St. Patrick's cemeteries, it's just scattershot. There's no rhyme or reason because they were burying their dead so fast they couldn't keep up. They couldn't wow. keep up. The graves were so scattered all over the place. Yeah, yellow fever was a huge source of death out here. And then, of course, you have crime and desperation. You have people living in what some people consider this romantic, sensationalized life of sin. Spending your life in sin and misery in the house of the rising sun. That whole, that whole, that whole jazz. You have a lot of people getting killed by the various different mafias that never existed, by the way. They never, they never happened. Maf of course. Mafia it's a myth. But no, like the Irish Mafia, Italian Mafia, all these things, a lot of death happened because of that. To this day, we still have, you know, the, we're the third highest murder rate in America in the city. You'll be fine, tourists. Uh, just uh, <laughs> stay in the French Quarter. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I just uh, go enjoy the city. But on that note, death has been so ubiquitous in the city for a long time. It kind of makes one wonder if the Native Americans knew what they were talking about when they said, to build a city in a cursed swampland. It's been over 300 years of learning the hard way since. And I think, honestly, that is a big reason why we live it up so hard here. Why we party so hard. Why we enjoy life so much. Because there's enough strife and struggle in the world as it is. We should live up the good parts of it while we can. We know there'll be another hurricane someday, probably sooner than later. And I would love to say this on video. I always wait for the chance to be able to say this because I don't get to say this enough to tourists on my tours. The average tourist will never get to see what I consider is the most beautiful part of New Orleans. It's not the beads and the booze and the boobies and all that stuff. What people think of like, oh, Mardi Gras, fun times. That's cute and fun and go enjoy it. But that's all skin deep. That's the glitter and glam. What's really beautiful in New Orleans is after that storm hits, after all the windows are shattered and the trees, branches are crashed to the streets and the gas stations are all emptied out, everything is quiet as a tomb after the winds go away. There's a brief moment of just quiet for a good minute. And then suddenly you start noticing your neighbors coming out of their houses. Suddenly you start noticing people going to check in on each other. Hey, are you good? Are you good? You got food over there? Our fridge is full of meat. We're taking it out. We're firing up the grill. You need to charge your phone. I got a generator. Let's get everybody in the neighborhood who needs to charge up their devices. I got my generator in the back. That is the true beauty of New Orleans. Is we know when disaster strikes this city, because it will, it always does. It happens over and over. But it's such a beautiful city. It's such an important city. It's such an irreplaceable city. Once this city is gone, you will never see anything like it again. We know that we want to stay here. And we're going to take care of each other next time something bad happens. That, I think, is the most beautiful part of the city. And that is an important part of life. When death comes knocking, we take care of each other. We get through it as long as we can till we can't no more. And that's what it's about. That's why the city is still here despite everything. Beautiful and powerful. And I love it, man. Well done. I'd like to use that to tie into local traditions for respect of the dead. Because I always like to, whenever we do delve into the darker side, as we do sometimes with these Halloween specials, I like to find that light in the darkness. That light seems to be very much in the local 
mm -hmm. community, yes. uh, in the local traditions of respect. Things like the jazz funeral. Yes. You had mentioned that the dead outnumber the living in New Orleans. There must be that sense of reverence to the past literally all around you. Well, yes, the dead outnumber the living in New Orleans easily well over 10 to 1. That's why it's known as the city of the dead. We're just living in it. The dead very much have a big part of our culture here. There's no shying away from it really in this city because I know I've noticed that we tend to have a culture that unless we're watching true crime documentaries or horror movies or stuff, we don't really like to think about death that much. We, we try to put it out of our minds, but it's inevitable. It happens to all of us. Memento mori. Yeah, memento, exactly. That's why I always have a, a symbol of death, a symbol of life, and a symbol of time on my person to keep me grounded. But yeah, the dead are very much part of life in this city. You can't really travel very far in the city without coming across a cemetery. Or we also have, I don't know if you're familiar with ghost bikes. No. So they're pretty ubiquitous around New Orleans. I actually have a sign for a ghost bike what we call a ride for our lives rally. New Orleans is a big bike, bicyclist city. It's a small town. I ride an electric bike. You may have seen it, I don't know. Dressed up like a spooky undead Pegasus. It's got wings and a horse head and green lights and a skeleton and all that on it. But I've had so many close calls with death just riding my bike through the city because let's face it, a lot of these folks are driving around drunk. They're from out of state. They just got off Bourbon Street and it's a city that was built for horses. When you get to like the French Quarter area and the neighborhoods around here you, know, you got a lot of one-way very slender roads mm -hmm. i always recommend taking an uber or a lyft or a taxi or a pedicab you know avoid trying to drive out here if you're not used to this kind of driving so because of that a lot of bicyclists get killed here pretty often mm -hmm. and it's a big problem we we constantly are putting pressure on the city to make more safe bike lanes to uh, increase bike safety awareness and one of the things we do is called ghost bikes every now and then you will find a bicycle chained to a tree or a street light or something stationary and it's completely spray painted white. Oftentimes it will have a name and a date on it. Sometimes flowers, Mardi Gras beads. That means a person was tragically killed there by a careless driver hitting them while they were on their bike. And we have them all over the city. This actually got so bad that the city of New Orleans actually started taking them down, like cutting the chains and throwing the bikes away, saying that it was a blight on the city. Oh. And the, so the memorials saying, were the problem, not the deaths. Yeah, the, the markers were the problem. That's exactly how we responded. They were like, don't you think all of our dead bodies on the street is a blight? You know, it's, it's a very dark, morbid subject. I'm sorry. But that is a, another example of like how we confront death, how we actively talk about it. Like this is something that's currently happening right now. We are making a, an artistic expression. We are doing something to show you. Hey, keep in mind, we're surrounded by problems all the time. Let's not forget about them. One of the New Orleans nicknames we have is the city that care for God. It's not as used as popular as it used to now. But like city that care for God sounds like either a good thing or a bad thing. It's a, it's a duality. Oh, a place where all your cares can go away. You just have a great time. You go and have your fun. You don't have to worry about nothing. You don't have to care about nothing. On the flip side, when you stop caring is when things fall apart. That's kind of like the dichotomy, the duality of, of that. You had mentioned the jazz funeral, to bring it back to that note. The jazz funeral, it's an old, old, old tradition. And it actually came from West African Haitian culture, I believe. Oh. Uh, it started off with the idea that when they were taking the body to the graveyard, they would actually zigzag through the streets and do a big, elaborate, complicated path so that the spirits would not know how to get back. They would be confused. They would get lost. They would not know what direction to go. They would be meant to confuse the spirits, to go wander throughout all the city, to take them to the graveyard. Then once the body is placed in the grave and they drop them off, everybody turns around and the brass band that had just played a solemn, sad, somber funeral dirge on the way out there. On the way back, they start picking up the beat and blasting loud, swinging jazz music. Everybody's having a great time. They were wiping their tears away with handkerchiefs, start waving their handkerchiefs in the air. Now they have uh, white handkerchiefs, which is a symbol of life. They have umbrellas, black and white umbrellas, black representing death, white representing life. They will march through the street, blasting loud, cheering music, which is partially a way to confuse the spirits into thinking, oh, we're having a party. And two, it's also to be a celebration of life. Like we have done the funeral, death has been processed. And we're out here living it up. It's an important thing, you know, of like remembering we're all going to die someday. So be alive while you can. In fact, if I can go on a little tangent here. Please. So we have Mardi Gras in New Orleans. Mobile, Alabama, I always like to say they, they created Mardi Gras. They were the first ones to do it. Good for them. We do it better. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> uh, everybody comes to New Orleans for Mardi Gras. 
but about 1.5 million people come to Mardi Gras every year. The very first Mardi Gras parade, I would say, on Mardi Gras Day, Fat Tuesday itself, is the Skull and Bones Gang. They've been around for over 200 years, nearly 300 at this point. I try to catch them every year, which is difficult to do because they kick off at five o'clock in the morning in the mm. Treme neighborhood. The Treme neighborhood is the old established African-American neighborhood in American history, which used to be the spot of town where all the enslaved people and people of color in general would gather outside the city only on Sundays because by law, they were not allowed to gather in the city. White people were afraid of an enslaved people's revolt, so they would gather just outside the city. They were given a place known as Congo Square, nowadays known as Louis Armstrong Park, mm. which right across the street from where the tour started. Uh, <laughs> Armstrong Park was originally Congo Square, and that was the one place where people of color were allowed to gather, only on Sundays, because they were baptized Catholic by force, they were allowed to have Sundays off. And they were put outside the city, so they could have one day off to hang out with each other, so that maybe would quell a revolt. That eventually grew into the Treme, the first established African-American neighborhood in American history. And in the Treme, the Skull and Bones gang kicks off their practice at five o'clock in the morning. They're all dressed up as skulls and bones. They're, they're wearing costumes. Some of them are walking on stilts and they're beating rhythmic drums. And they start beating these drums. And for a good while, like five, 10 minutes, they're just doing this rhythmic drum beat. And then they start singing this song about how you're gonna go out there and party. You're going to go get drunk. You're going to go do drugs. You're going to go get crazy and all this. But don't forget, you're going to die. Like, don't forget, you're going to die. So live it up and be careful. Take care of yourself. Protect your life. Because one of these days, you're going to be us. We are you in the future. We are death. You're going to be dead. So appreciate life while you can and take care of it. Don't get too crazy out there because you might not be alive much longer if you're not careful. And that's their whole thing of just like, be mindful of your life. Be careful. And then they walk throughout the neighborhood and they bang on people's doors at five <laughs> o'clock in the morning, six o'clock in the morning, which probably would normally get you shot. But on Mardi Gras morning, it's known that, that that's the dead coming to wake the living up and remind them, enjoy it while it lasts and protect it, take care of it. And it's a fascinating, beautiful little ritual. And um, I try to catch it every year. But like I said, five o'clock in the morning is rough, especially when you've been partying for a month <laughs> because it's Mardi Gras. Well, I was going to say, you have the excuse of doing night tours, too. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I know. Getting home at midnight, you know. <laughs> like, but yeah, no, that's that's one of my, my favorite practices out here in New Orleans is like the dead waking the living up to remind them they're alive and they won't be forever. That's the very first thing, very first event of Mardi Gras Day. I, I love it. And so we're here. So laissez les bon temps rouler. Let the yeah. good times roll. Well, Christian, this has been... So fantastic. Wanted to ask if uh, if anybody listening, watching is passing through New Orleans, they want to catch one of your tours. How can they make that happen? I am currently happily employed with Haunted History Tours, the largest spooky tour company in New Orleans. I think they were the originators. They started in the early 90s, I believe. So they've been around for 30 years. I specialize in the Dead of Night Cemetery Bus Tour. I'm currently working six days a week. They got a 7 p.m. bus, a 9.30 p.m. bus. If you want to take my tour specifically, I always recommend just request Christian. That's me. Every now and then I'll do like a spooky ghost tour or, you know, a daytime cemetery tour. But generally, if you want to get a good bus tour, I'll be happy to have folks on my bus. I always recommend, you know, like I used to work over at the Museum of Death in New Orleans as well. So I'll give them a shout out, you know, tell them Christian sent you. They hate that. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. They, I always try to send them some uh, some folks. They send me folks. So, you know, we all work together. Well, man, thank you again so much. I really do appreciate you bringing in your personal story and your family legacy going back for so long as well. Uh, just the connections to everything and to the life that we're living. So Absolutely. here's to it.